So, so far when we've been talking about electric flux, we've been assuming that the electric field is constant. Um, so we're using uh, an electric flux model that says that we have just the dot product of electric field and area. Now we know from looking at different electric field lines and different electric field configurations, the electric field is not always constant. In fact, um, you know, so the, this last problem we did, the electric field is constant and it's given to us as constant, AKA uniform. Um, and the only time we really have a uniform electric field is for a capacitor. Um, there's different kinds of electric fields that we calculated in the previous chapter. So we have uniform, right? So this would be plus Q minus Q. So we have the uniform field of a parallel plate capacitor. So that would be um, electric field is equal to eta over epsilon naught, right? We also have the, the point charge and a point charge is not uniform. And one of the ways you can tell um, these things are not uniform is that you can see that the electric field lines don't have even spacing through everything. So um, the point charge, electric field of a point charge, is a Coulomb's law situation. So that's an inverse square relationship, very much not constant. We also have a line of charge, right? So if we have a line of charge... then we know that the electric field points out, and this looks more like a, a bottle brush, right? It should also be coming out of the page at you and going into the page. Um, we also have the, the infinite plane, which looks a lot like the capacitor, but here's for the line of charge. Um, the line of charge looks something like uh, one over R, right? So it drops off as one over R. Um, so, these, this is uniform. These electric fields are not uniform. So what do we do when the electric field is not uniform? Well, that's an interesting problem because but then at each point where your area crosses your field, you have a little bit different electric field. So for instance, if you wanna put a, a surface um, here, like just a flat surface here, the electric field here is going to be different from the electric field here. This one will be stronger. This one will be weaker. The other thing is they're not going to have the same angle. You have different angles, right? So your field is different, right? So this one's going to be stronger. This one's going to be weaker and you have a different angle. So we're gonna have to be able to calculate all of that as we integrate across the surface. And you can see we're drawing here in two dimensions or, or one dimension, but this is actually a three dimensional situation. So it's sort of more like um, this thing where you see there's arrows going through the surface. But what if those arrows are all different sizes? You can't just multiply the electric field times the area. Um, so in order to do that, we have to really think about um, the electric flux for a non-uniform electric field. Okay, so if we pick a surface like this, let's pick a little dot here. Okay, let's say the electric field points this way. We'll call this electric field E sub I. So it's some little electric field vector that goes through this point. Here is the area vector for this little square. Okay, and they have an angle between them. So you would do E sub I dot delta A sub I, and that's, that's that. But of course, then this whole surface is made up of other little patches. So if your electric field is a little bit different over here, you have to do the dot product of this and this. And you'll have to add up all of these little squares. So guess, guess what that looks like? Double that is a double integral. Why is it a double integral? Yeah, you're integrating over a surface. You have to integrate in the x direction and the y direction. Okay, so you're integrating over a surface area, so it's a surface area integral. Okay? And for a closed surface, this equals the flux. Alright? So the electric field, and obviously this isn't a closed surface, this would just be one part of the closed surface, but for the flux, you do this 
double integral. This is called a surface integral, okay? This circle means closed, all right? So that means it has to be a closed surface. So if you do this, does this count for this? No, right? This is just one side of a three-dimensional surface. So you want the surface area of a closed three-dimensional object, all right? So you can calculate the flux through that area, right? But then it's not, then you would just write it as a double integral. So if it has that circle, that means it has to be a closed surface. And so you can calculate the flux through a non-closed surface, but you'll see as we get into Gauss's law that that doesn't give you all the information you need for Gauss's law. So anyway, remember, it's easy to calculate flux if your electric field is constant at every point on the surface. Because remember, if electric field is so, if electric field is constant, if something's constant and it's an integral, what can you do with it? Pull it out. Pull it out. Okay. But in order to pull out E, if it's constant, this dot product also has to go away. So that means this dot product has to be either zero or one. Okay, so that means cosine theta has to be either 0 or 1, all right? Which means that your electric field vectors have to be perpendicular or parallel at every point on the closed surface that you choose, okay? So here's where the Plato comes in, okay? I want you to make these shapes. So take a point charge and then make the Gaussian surface you would put around the point charge, okay? Make a line charge and then create the Gaussian surface that you would put around the line charge. Make a plane and then create the Gaussian surface you would put on this plane. And this is including, right, those constraints. So you want the electric field to be either, if, if it's parallel, right, then that's going to give you a dot product of zero. If it's perpendicular, then the electric field has to be constant, okay? Okay, so let's start with a point charge, and you're going to have to use a little bit of imagination here because we're drawing this in two dimensions, and it's obviously a three-dimensional thing. So let's start with our point charge. And the electric field for a point charge, um, it's got field lines that look like this. So these field lines point out. You can, and because we know that the electric field is equal to kq over r squared, we know that for any particular radius, we're going to have a constant electric field because as long as um, this is constant, this is constant, and this is constant, the electric field should be constant. And what that means is um, if you draw a Gaussian surface and you, remember, this looks more like a, a spike ball, like a like a sea urchin, um, because it should be pointing out of the page and into the page. It's a sphere. It's a spherical symmetry. But we're drawing it in two dimensions, so it's going to look like a circle. So sorry about that. Now, for instance, oops, this is a circle. Now, if you put the circle over here, the radii aren't all equal, and then because of that, the electric field's going to be different at all these different points. So you'll have a different electric field than you have over here. So it's very important to use the symmetry of this thing and center it right on this point charge. If you center it right on the point charge, then all of these radii should be the same distance and that means at each point, the electric field should be constant. We also know because this is a, a surface that it has a surface normal that points out. And so for each point on the surface, you should have an electric field vector and a normal vector that are parallel and all the electric field vectors um, should be the same uh, magnitude, okay? So obviously this is actually a sphere. So if you want to draw it as a sphere, 
it's it's three dimensional. So for uh, that means for our point charge, the electric field will be perpendicular to the surface at all points on a sphere. Okay, so that's what we have for a point charge. So um, we'll call that the point charge. Okay, and here's our point charge. Okay, if we want to do the um, infinite line of charge, okay, the infinite line of charge we can draw, and it's hard to draw an infinite line, obviously, but bear with me. So this line's not exactly infinite. Well, let's fill it in. And let's say this is a positively charged line. And so the electric field is gonna look more like a bottle brush. We're gonna have to draw it a particular way. So um, like this. where these should be more evenly spaced. So let me um, and they should point in both directions. And they should also point sort of out of the page and into the page. So it should go, uh, you know, sort of like a, a bottle brush. So here's our field. And once again, um, if you want to figure out the electric field, um, the electric field for an infinite line of charge should be um, uh, K, lambda k over r. Oh, sorry. 2k lambda over r, which is an inverse field. Um, so since this electric field points out in all directions, a good Gaussian surface to choose would be a cylinder. And the reason for that is the cylinder has two kinds of surfaces. So at this surface, um, sort of this outer part of the cylinder, the round part, at each point where this electric field, let me just actually start down here, where each electric field line crosses out of the cylinder, you can see the normal vector for the cylinder on this outside part should be parallel to the electric field. And you can also see that the electric field should be constant. So all these vectors should be the same size. Whoops. At these points. Now, at the ends, we have a slightly different situation. And so let's say at the, these end caps, oops, let me just draw that better. At these end caps here and here, you end up having um, normal normal vectors that look like this. But now these are perpendicular to your electric field vectors. 
and therefore they're going to give you a dot product of zero. So where you care about the electric field vector and the normal vector, you end up getting these nice things where they're parallel and then all of these electric field vectors point in the same direction and are the same magnitude. So that satisfies our, our Gaussian surface. So for an infinite um, line of charge, which obviously goes this way and this way too, you can pick a cylinder. And the, it turns out you can pick a, a non-infinite cylinder and we'll go over why that is in a little bit. Um, and just, just to be clear, this is a surface over here too, so we'll color it in. It's a sphere, okay? Last but not least, um, we can talk about the infinite plane of charge. And so the infinite plane of charge uh, looks something like this, okay? And we'll color that in. So this is our infinite plane of charge. And it has an electric field that looks like this. So, you know, above the plane, oops, you have electric field lines pointing up and below the plane, you have electric field lines pointing down. And, and these should be sort of everywhere, but you get the idea. So you could have, you know, stuff over here and stuff over here. Mm. Anyway, um, so this not particularly well drawn, but you can see for this, you just need some sort of box type thing. So um, we're gonna pick our Gaussian surface to be, oops. Something that looks like this. And it goes below two. So, oops. so here we have a Gaussian surface that's a box. And let me just draw a better version of this so you can see the lines. So. Here you can see it's a box. Um, at these points where the electric field goes through, you can see the normal vector should be parallel to the electric field vector, right? Um, and then at each point through the box, the electric field vector should be the same because we know the electric field is constant, right? Because the electric field for an infinite plane is just eta over epsilon naught, where this is a constant. So that means no matter where you put this plane, No matter where you put this plane, um, it's going to have a constant electric field going through it the whole time. And then you just want to align, make it so it's lined up with the normal vector. So the normal vectors in the electric field point the same way. And then if you look at these sides, for all of these, um, the normal vector points either this way or this way, which is perpendicular to the electric field vectors, which only point up and up and up and down like this. So that's going to give you zero. So that means for uh, any kind of infinite plane uh, or a capacitor or anything like that, you want to have um, sort of a box configuration. It could also be a cylindrical box where your, your surface is a circle like this, as long as it still meets the criteria where the sides are perpendicular. So that's the infinite, infinite plane. 
Okay, so let's actually calculate an electric flux. Um, and we're going to start with the gas, uh, just a Gaussian sphere of radius r, which has a charge q at its center. So sort of what we were doing in the previous example, we have this charge q, right? Um, we'll call this q. It has electric field lines that look something like this. And they have arrows pointing this way. We want to have our Gaussian sphere. <laughs> this is a very bad sphere. So we center the sphere on the charge. Um, we know it's a sphere. We know it's a full surface. All right. And we know the sphere has a radius. Let's actually draw that with gray. So we have a radius R, and we know the charge has a charge Q, okay? Um, so looking at our equation, we know that the electric flux is the surface integral of the electric field dot the differential area. Um, and so looking at this, we can see at all points on the sphere, uh, the normal vector looks like this. And then our electric field vectors look something like this, and they should all be constant because they're all at the same radius r. Uh, because we know that the electric field of a point charge is k, and this is an a vector q over r squared in the r hat direction, where this is actually the r hat direction, it's the outward radial direction. Um, so we know if this is a constant r, then we can rewrite this as kq, and in this case it's q over r squared. This is our electric field. It points out in the radial direction. So that would be this part of our our guy, all right? And then the area vector, you can see um, because this is constant, we can pull out the electric field because you end up with uh, K, sorry, let's move, just move this in. end up with kq over r squared. That's all, that's all constant. Um, the dot product goes away because you can see these two vectors are parallel. So then you just end up with dA. Because this is constant, right, you can pull it out because that's how integrals work. So now you have dA. But so we're integrating, this is the, the area of the Gaussian surface, but since we know that the Gaussian surface is actually a sphere, when we do that, that means we're just taking the area of the sphere. So that becomes um, kq over r squared. We'll just pull it down. kq over r squared. And now we just figure out the area of the sphere because we know this is just that thing over there. So that what's the, the surface area of a sphere? Well, that's going to be four pi 
are squared. And if that is unfamiliar to you, uh, brush up on your geometry, okay? The nice thing about this is you can see that um, since we know what k is, we end up with uh, q, remember k is four pi epsilon naught, so that's four pi epsilon naught r squared times four pi r squared. We can do some fun canceling, so the r squareds cancel, the pi cancels, the four cancels, and then we end up with a flux that looks like q over epsilon naught. So that's our electric flux. It's our electric flux for a point charge. So what we've done here is we looked at our flux and we calculated electric field in dA. We got rid of the dot product by notice by picking a shape such that the electric field vector and the dA vector, right, which points in the direction of the normal vector, right, so that's our dA vector, um, is the same direction as our electric field vector. So they're parallel, which means you get rid of the dot product. So that gets rid of the dot product. We know that the electric field of a point charge, we already know what that is. So when we figure out the electric field of a point charge, we're just plugging in the values uh, Q and R, which are given to us, remember, because we always have to have our answer in terms of what the question gives us. Then we put that into our integral. Because this is constant, we can pull it out. That leaves us with just a surface integral of the area of a sphere. The surface integral of the area of a sphere is just the area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. That's just some delightful geometry. With some creative canceling, we end up with um, a flux that looks like this. And this is the electric flux for a point charge through a Gaussian sphere. But it turns out because of the way flux works, no matter how you take the flux, this is always going to be what we get and this will lead us into some more interesting stuff about Gauss's law. Okay, so take a second and try to sort this one out on your own. So, we have an infinite line of charge and it's very hard to draw an infinite line of charge but uh, we'll make an attempt. I'm just going to draw part of it. So here's our infinite line of charge. Um, and so the electric field of an infinite line of charge looks like sort of a, a, a bottle brush or um, like a hairbrush, a round hairbrush. So the electric field lines go out in all the directions. Hang on, I'm going to just like... draw this out here. So, on some So the electric field lines look like this, but they, of course they also come out uh, of the page and go into the page because it's completely round. So it's kind of hard to visualize that, but this is the electric field lines, okay? This is an infinite line of charge, so it's gonna keep going in these directions. It has a charge density lambda. Um, and so as we discussed uh, when we talked about the problem where we were looking for the Gaussian surfaces, the best Gaussian surface for this is going to be a cylinder. And so we'll draw the cylinder. And the cylinder doesn't have to be infinite. It's not a good cylinder. Let's see. is hard. This is not an art class. So 
so here is our cylinder and this is a surface so just to be clear this is filled in so it's going around like this so uh, we're looking for the flux and of course the flux comes from this and we'll do the closed surface flux because this is a closed surface so that's going to be um, E dot DA so this is the electric flux for this infinite line of charge um, and we're dealing with a cylinder so in this case remember the cylinder is going to be in the DA uh, the electric field is going to be here don't forget the vector here and when we actually do this we want to integrate because it's a surface integral we want to integrate over all of the different parts of the surface well that means um, a couple things uh, one that we have to break this into so well first off let's just look at the the vectors so we have the da vectors so for each place where the electric field lines cross right so here like here 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 and then at the you know we have these ends you can look at the surface vectors so that would be da right there's a da there's a da uh, these are sort of the normal vectors to the surface. They point out because that's where the normal vector points. And then if you look at the electric field vectors, right, at this point, this would be E, 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 and then over here you have E. So these are your electric field and surface area vectors. Um, in order to get the full surface, the way you do this is you want to break this into basically three pieces, right? So you have the surface of um, the top circle, right? So this would be this area. So that's this surface. Uh, and that's going to have an E dot DA there. Uh, so that's the top circle plus sort of the surface of just the cylinder part, which is um, sort of this part. And then that's got an E dot DA. Remember, these are all vectors. And then you have the bottom. <laughs> E dot DA, which looks like that. So for each of these, uh, for the top, you can see the, the vector, the dot product gives us zero. So that's zero, right? This whole thing goes to zero. For this one, we can see um, that E, right, all of these E's, are going to be parallel, so the dot product goes away. Okay, so you end up with something that looks like this, no more vector. And then you have uh, the DA, right? So DA and E. These are parallel to each other, so the dot product goes away. The E is also constant, meaning you can pull it out, but we'll get to that in a minute. So this is for the cylinder part. And then this part, once again, is zero because you can see here, we also have a right angle. So the dot product is going to give us zero. So we come over here and then we have E, which should be constant. Now, why is E constant? Actually, let's do an aside here. Remember that um, for a cylinder, the electric field is 2K lambda over R. So when we plug everything in, that becomes 2K, and then this, this is our radius R, 2K lambda over R, which is a constant if we're at this constant R, okay? So we can plug that in, and we end up with, here's the cylinder, 
we have 2k lambda over r. That's our electric field, dA. So here's your electric field. And once again, dA should be our cylinder. Okay. Um, and because this is constant, we could pull it out. So you end up with 2k lambda over r. And now you just have dA for the cylinder. And just the outside part of the cylinder, just the green part of the cylinder, um, that's this. That's going to give us, uh, this is the circle, right? 2 pi r times the height, which is given as L. So we have 2k lambda over r. And this becomes um, 2 pi r L, just not the top and bottom, those are pi r squared, just the part that is the green part, so just this part. And then once again, this is our electric field, okay? And what? And so like we did before, we can come up here and we know that um, k is one over four pi epsilon naught. So that gives us, uh, when we rewrite, this we get 2 lambda over r 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught and we have 2 pi r l so we can do some canceling and see the pi is going to cancel we see that the twos are going to cancel with the four and we see the r's are going to cancel so we end up with something that looks like lambda l over epsilon naught so this is our flux. I'm gonna make that a little bit cleaner. Um, let me just clean that up a little. So that is our, whoops. But here you'll notice something interesting. Um, this, if we remember what lambda means, so lambda is, is linear charge density, so that's Q over L. If you plug that in, you get Q over L, L over epsilon naught. Once again, you get Q over epsilon naught. So really, we're only worried about the charge enclosed in this thing from here to here. That's all that contributes to the electric field that we're dealing with here in this problem. So once again, using just by calculating the flux, we find that the flux is related to the charge that's enclosed by the Gaussian surface. And even though this is an infinite thing, uh, we're getting a non-infinite answer because it's only the charge that's inside, not the charge on the whole line. So something to remember going forward is that you can see that the flux depends only on the charge. So last but not least, we will calculate the flux through a closed cube. So basically we're doing the infinite plane. So we'll start by um, figuring out what the infinite plane looks like. And of course, it's pretty hard to draw an infinite plane. So we're just gonna draw a piece of it and you'll just have to know that it extends out in the, all the other directions. So here is our infinite plane. And I guess the easiest way would be to... And now we got an infinite plane. Okay. Um, color that in Okay, so that's the infinite plane of charge. It's a positively 
charged thing and then we know there's like electric field lines coming out of it there's they're constant so you know that's um they point up above it and down below it and that's what that looks like then you got to draw the um box that goes over this so that looks something like this and That's our Gaussian surface. Oops. So you can see that goes through there and because it's a Gaussian surface, we can color it in. And this should be a cube. I didn't draw a very good cube, but essentially um, you can, and you can see here where it, like is touching the it's actually where it's on the plane um so this has sides of length l it's essentially a cube and you can see um everywhere that the electric field passes through it right it should have um these perpendicular or these parallel parts where um, you can see the on the top and bottom, you have parallel vectors on the sides, right? Like including this side and that side. These vectors should be perpendicular to the electric field. So when we look at our flux, and this is a closed surface, um, you get E dot DA, where E is the electric field and DA has to do with the Gaussian surface. Um, so you have to, let me bring this over here. You have to break this into E dot DA for the top. Right, and technically there should be six of these. So you also get E dot DA for the sides. Two, three, four. So this would be the top, this would be the bottom. So top, bottom. And then, oops, then the sides, that would be this one. And then another side, that would be this one. And then this side, that would be this one. And then this side on the back, that would be this one. But of course, because you have vectors that point out versus vectors that point up or basically not in the same direction as the uh, area vector, all of these guys should go to zero. So six sides to the cube, only the top and bottom matter. Um, and oh, all of these should be vectors still, just um, should have done that first, but that's how we know the dot product goes to zero. For these two, the dot product goes to one. Um, and the other thing we remember, need to remember is the electric field for an infinite plane is, the, is eta, which is the charge density over epsilon naught, which is a constant. Um, so remember, this thing has a charge density eta. And because of that, we know both of these, so we can just do, so top has um, eta over epsilon naught dA, and bottom 
also has eta over epsilon naught dA. But remember, this is just the square, and this is also a square. So our area, well, we can pull, first we can pull these out, and since these are identical, we'll just say 2 eta over epsilon naught dA, where this is just the area of the top and the area of the bottom, but those are the same, right? Because we're just dealing with, um, ooh, Nope, that's not gonna work. So we're because we're just dealing with the top and bottom, so um, that would be. I guess we'll do it in green, just the top and the bottom. So that's this. Okay, there's two of those. Um, the if you do that integral, you get two eta over epsilon naught, uh, and that's going to give you l squared. So just cleaning that up, that means our electric flux is 2 eta L squared Oh, sorry. The the this I lost a two over here. So there's a two for all of these because this isn't a capacitor. This is a plane. Um, so that means you get eta over epsilon naught. We can cancel the twos, and you get eta over epsilon eta l squared over epsilon naught. So that is your electric flux for your infinite plane, but remember, um, eta is equal to charge over area. In this case, the area is L squared, so you can write that as charge over L squared, and so that means uh, charge is equal to eta L squared. And that means this is essentially the same thing as the last two, which is Q and it's the enclosed Q over epsilon naught because the charge that we're looking for, right, the Q naught, that's just the charge that's in this enclosed thing. So it's just the chunk of the, the sh infinite plane that's enclosed by the box. And so this would scale no matter how big or small you make the box, you're always going to get this answer. So we're finding that no matter what we do, the flux just depends on the charge inside your Gaussian surface. Okay, so try this problem yourself. Uh, think about it, answer it, and then we'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so if we're looking for the total electric flux through the box, um, we're looking for uh, flux. So remember flux, ooh, oh boy. Electric flux is equal to E dot dA. But remember, the sides of this box have uh, dA's that do not point in the same direction as the E, so all three sides go to zero. Oh, sorry, all four sides go to zero. So we only have the top and bottom and bottom, and those are E, D, A, uh, and because the electric field is constant, which we're given it's one newton per coulomb, um, we know that this ends up being two E, D, A, where this is two E times the area of one side of the box. So in this case, when we're talking about 2, then E is 1 newton per coulomb, and the area is 1 meter squared. So we end up with 2 newton meters squared over coulombs, and that's going to be this guy.